it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Michael Togus, yeah. uh, who is co-author of the book called Above and Beyond. This is the untold story of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and it is extremely important from uh, a historical standpoint. Uh, what a fantastic history this story is, and what a, it's actually probably one of the most important events that happened in, in America during the 20th century. One book's title I, I, that he's done that I really love is called There is a Porcupine in My Outhouse. <laughs> the Vermont Misadventures of a Mountain Man uh, Wannabe. Very, very cute. As I say, he's done 29 books, which is, is remarkable in and of itself. He lectures across the country uh, on each of his book uh, topics. So, and, and I've been speaking with him and he, he really enjoys speaking about these subjects that he loves them so well. Uh, speaking on the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, Michael Conical's 13 harrowing days, as he calls it, and outlines and steps that uh, President John F. Kennedy made to reach a decision on the course of action, uh, of action giving special emphasis to the heroes of the crisis. It, it's, it's very detailed um, in its orientation, and having just read it recently, it brought back to light things that I knew uh, about when I was growing up in Miami during the period of, of the, the Cuban crisis, which uh, ultimately has affected a great many of us who uh, have lived in the South Florida area and the mass migration of Cubans uh, to South Florida. Uh, he will also tell about uh, four lesser known incidents that put the entire world on edge uh, about a possible nuclear war. And unfortunately, we're right back almost where we started from today, considering what's going on in the world. So uh, what's happened in Cuba has, has had a tremendous effect on, on us in, in America. Uh, in Miami, almost 50% of our population now is, is Cuban or is Cuban descent. So without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming out on this nice day. Uh, my author talk today will be a, a little bit different than others where I want you to feel like you're watching a movie with me, that it's just me and you, and I'm taking you through these 13 days. And I wondered how many people in the audience knew that during the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Russians shot down and killed one of our pilots. I did not know that, so only maybe five people in this whole audience knew that. So that's what attracted me to this particular topic. It was a part of the Cuban Missile Crisis I didn't know. I always thought it ended peacefully with no loss of life, uh, but there was one combat casualty. And um, that's one of those lesser known stories that I'll take you through. So I've, I've got a lot of slides, so again we go fast. It's going to be like watching a movie. At the end, I'll probably be bumping up against my time limit, so I'll just do probably maybe two questions. And then down below, we'll do the uh, book signing, but I'd be happy to take more questions then. All right, buckle up, and we're ready to roll. So the first part of the presentation, I want to introduce you to some of the lead characters and give you a little background about the build-up to the Cuban Missile Crisis. And, and one of the lead characters in the book is the U-2 spy plane, uh, an amazing aircraft that can fly 13 miles above the Earth, so higher than any Russian MiG could get to. Um, really an incredible invention. I, I call it a glider on steroids. So lightweight, but yet has a jet engine and can get over 70,000 feet. 
But um, up there, of course, you're in the stratosphere, so you're going to need a pressure suit if your cockpit uh, loses air pressure. And this, this pressure suit will keep you alive. And believe it or not, these were manufactured in a uh, bra and girdle factory in Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, which still makes them today. Uh, the pilots I interviewed said, oh, God, we were taken there in total secrecy. And we walk in, and we didn't know why. And they said, you go into the basement, a secret room, and we're measured for the pressure suit. Uh, by the way, this is Steve Heiser, the pilot who discovered the first nuclear missile in Cuba. Uh, once we discovered the missiles, the government got our 10 top U-2 pilots into Florida to start flying over Cuba as often as we could to gather intelligence for a potential attack and invasion. And the stakes couldn't be higher because you have these two nuclear superpowers uh, the USSR and the United States butting heads over this issue. So the buildup, you have Castro overthrowing Batista, then you have our failed Bay of Pigs invasion. I look back at that invasion though and I think that might have been a blessing because it happened during President Kennedy's watch and he learned so much from that failure. Uh, he learned a number of things of what not to do in a crisis. And he applied those during the Cuban mice, uh, Missile Crisis. So it, it might have been a blessing in disguise. So the Soviets begin their military buildup, assuring us the whole time that there's no nuclear weapons involved. And then we get our first proof from that U-2 spy plane by Steve Heiser. And you know, when I researched Khrushchev, I thought first he'd be this mercurial character, you know, uh, just full of emotion, but I later came to the conclusion he was a pretty shrewd operator, and I had the good fortune to interview his son, Sergei, who ironically uh, lives in the United States now. He's a resident of Rhode Island, but Sergei was old enough uh, to have conversations with his father during the Cuban Missile Crisis, so Part of that perspective is, is based on those interviews I did with Sergei Khrushchev. And you know, the missiles, besides being a military threat, because they could reach Washington, D.C. in about 10 minutes, uh, Kennedy rightly said it's a political threat. He said, I'll be impeached if I allow these missiles to stand. And, and I think he was right. I don't think the American people would have stood for it right on our doorstep. So the approach I took in this book was write it for the general public. Uh, because Again, I was coming at it like you. I just knew the periphery of the story. So when I was diving in, I was learning as I went. I, I didn't even know how big Cuba was. Um, I was surprised that it's 780 miles across. I didn't know where the Bay of Pigs invasion happened, where our Guantanamo Bay is. And now I'm going to introduce you to some of the lead characters. This is the youngest U-2 pilot who flew over Cuba. His name is Jerry McElmoyle. Jerry is alive and well today and was instrumental in the research. Um, but at the time, he was the youngest, so he was the, kind of the low man on totem pole. His boss was Major Rudy Anderson. Rudy was an interesting guy because even though he's in the Air Force, he's a pacifist. He doesn't want to drop any bombs, so he's always volunteering for reconnaissance missions. Uh, so during the Korean War, that's what he did. And then when people realized what a good pilot he was, uh, the CIA recruited him into the U-2 program, trained him to fly U-2s, very temperamental aircraft to fly, and then uh, back to the Air Force, but continuing to fly the U-2 spy planes. And then Chuck Maltzby, he also was in the Korean War, a fighter pilot, was shot down by the Chinese. And he said that during his three years of being held as a POW, he was held in a, an earthen pit, four feet by four feet. And yet, three years he survives, and when he's released, rather than leaving the Air Force, he re-ups, which, which shocked me. I would, I would have gotten out of the military after those three years as a POW, so another exceptional, and then he went on to become a U-2 pilot. 
And of course, President Kennedy, now, when I started the book, I wasn't sure just how big a role he would have, but I quickly found out that he secretly audio recorded every single meeting he had on the Cuban Missile Crisis. He never told the people, by the way, that who were in the cabinet room, but he was recording it all, and so those tapes are available to the public. And you listen to those and your hair stands up, because in some instances, they're arguing about the fate of the world. And so I said, I've got to put some of the more dramatic scenes in, particularly in relationship to some of the U-2 overflights. So uh, oftentimes, in Above and Beyond, there's direct quotes from uh, JFK and his advisors during these meetings. So, you know, the, the film that the U-2 pilots took is old-fashioned film. It did have to be developed, so there was a good 24-hour turnaround. So by the time it got to Kennedy, a couple days had gone by, and he was informed while having breakfast. And I wondered, what will his first question be? I thought it'd be, you know, how many or where in Cuba? But he surprised me. He asked, when will they be operational? In other words, he wanted to know the time frame he had to work with to get them out of there. Uh, because once they're operational, they'd have us over a, over a barrel. And his second question was, they showed him this shot, and he said, well, how do you know? I, don't, I can't see any nuclear missiles. And they said, Mr. President, you know, at the National Photographic Center, uh, which, by the way, was over a used car dealership, <laughs> dealership for uh, secrecy, He's, um, they assured him, we've brought in all our experts, we have the capacity to enlarge these, and uh, we're giving you 100% assurance that they are uh, medium-range ballistic missiles carrying uh, nuclear warheads. And this, this is where they were analyzed at that National Photographic Center. So, after, you know, he asked that question about how much time, and he was told roughly between 10 and 14 days, and that turned out to be a pretty good estimate of what was happening. Basically, uh, the missiles were there in Cuba. They just had to be put on the launch pads, and the, the warheads had to be put on, and it turned out the warheads were in Cuba also. His second step was, who's going to be my team of advisors? And I thought this was really telling that he didn't just go with the National Security Council. He was picking people for their minds. So like I was surprised that they had the Secretary of the Treasury on his advisory team, but he thought that person was really bright. He goes, I want them in the room. So he was hand-picking people to advise him. And uh, oftentimes, they'd be people with very differing viewpoints. So he was trying to get this wide cross-range of opinions to help him make a decision. So this shot was actually taken during one of the days of deliberation about the missiles. So you see Bobby standing up. He was at every single meeting. He was intimately involved. He might have even known about the secret audio recording. Uh, the microphones, by the way, were hidden in the bookcases. And then down in the White House basement was the big reel-to-reel -reel player. Uh, President Kennedy is leaning over the table on the far right. You see LBJ there. But it was a wide assortment of advisors. And so the, one of the early decisions Kennedy makes is, he goes, I want as many U-2 flights over the island as possible. Prior to Steve Heiser's flight discovering the missiles, he was keeping most of the flights on the periphery of the island because he knew that Gary Powers had been shot down over Russia in 1960 and didn't want to have another one of our pilots shot down. But once we knew there were nuclear weapons there, then he wants all the information he can get. So Major Rudy Anderson is the next one to fly. He comes back with the film, and when the film's developed, it's more bad news. It's, it's not, hey, there's just one nuclear missile in San Cristobal. There's multiple nuclear missiles in multiple locations scattered around Cuba, and they're protected by surface-to-air missiles. So uh, there's a lot of new information coming in on, on day one of the 13 days of the crisis. 
by the way, the, the U2 is an amazing uh, invention, really. From the time the idea was put out there and it got congressional funding to build, it only took them three and a half years to get it operational. You know, this lightweight aircraft that could go far higher than any other. And one thing they quickly learned is, you know, the wings were so long that on takeoff, oftentimes they would scrape the ground. So they came up with this idea of, let's just put these pogo sticks, they're detachable underneath the wings. So as soon as it gets airborne, they just drop away. And then by the time it lands, the aircraft is lighter because it's used the fuel so the wings are, are no longer scraping the runway. So while it was a complex aircraft in some ways, in other ways, just very simple, these detachable pogo sticks. And they assembled these top 10 pilots down in uh, Orlando, Florida. So this is long before Disney World, when McCoy Airfield was there. Get them close to Cuba because they need good weather reports. You cannot take pictures on a cloudy day. That was the weakness in the surveillance program. So they had to make sure the weather was good and then launch and get down to Cuba. There, there's a funny story behind this picture. This is a, probably midway through the crisis. And Kennedy is meeting with uh, the Soviet foreign minister and the Soviet ambassador. And, and the topic of Cuba comes up. And by this time, you know, Kennedy knows all about the nuclear missiles, but he hasn't tipped his hands to the American people or the Russians because he hasn't decided how he's going to remove them. He has made up his mind they've got to go. That's decision number one. He's just not sure how to accomplish that. And so when the topic of Cuba comes up, uh, these two men say to him, and we assure you there's no nuclear weapons there. And you can almost see Kennedy's body language, you know, going, oh, really? Is that so? Because right after the meeting, Bobby comes in and Kennedy's furious. He goes, I can't believe they lied to me right in the Oval Office. He said it was all I could do not to pull out the photos and shove it right under their nose. But he, he couldn't do it because he wants to hold his cards close to his vest because, again, he hasn't decided the course of action. Very interesting in the early days, you know, day one and two, he's pretty much for an all-out surprise airstrike probably followed up with a D-Day style invasion of the island. But he, but he hasn't given the go to do this yet. And Curtis LeMay is chopping out the bit or the cigar uh, to make it a go. Um, he, he's advocating to Kennedy, we should do it now. We've got the element of surprise. And Kennedy's like, well, what do you think the Russians are going to do when we start bombing and killing Russians? And LeMay in the meeting goes, absolutely nothing. And Kennedy goes, why will they do nothing? And LeMay goes, because they know we're stronger. And Kennedy goes, at the very least, they're going to take West Berlin. And uh, what happens in the course of several meetings, LeMay is outright, well, borderline. Let me use the word borderline insubordinate. Like he'll say things to Kennedy like, uh, you're very weak, Mr. President. This is worse than the appeasement of Munich. Another time he goes, uh, you're in a real fix, Mr. President. And Kennedy goes, what did you just say? And LeMay goes, I said you're in a real fix. And Kennedy goes, well, you're in it with me. And uh, he breaks the tension, and he doesn't kick LeMay out of the meeting. He thinks that, OK, you know, LeMay is far to the right on this subject, but I still want him in here for his viewpoint. So it's really, really interesting that he allows these debates where other leaders may not. So a few days in, he does make up his mind, much to the chagrin of Curtis LeMay. LeMay was the head of the Air Force Strategic Air Command, had control of a lot of our nuclear arsenal. Uh, Kennedy decides the blockade is going to be the first step. And, you know, a couple of people say that'll never work. And he says, that may be, but that's just one option I have. This is a first step. I don't want to go right to war. And, uh, you know, it just the logic makes perfect sense. But he does give the military one 
bone, if you will, and he says, if they shoot down one of our U-2s, uh, I'm giving you folks permission to go in and destroy that SAM site and any other surface to air missile sites in that vicinity. He goes on national TV, tells the nation. He does it in a very measured way. I mean, it's forceful, but it's not, uh, there's no, you know, uh, hysteria involved or, or really wild rhetoric because the people I have interviewed that live through it and who I hear from in audiences like this say, it was an anxious time and scary, but there was no, you know, panic. There was no, you know, rushing the grocery stores for supplies, nothing like that. But boy, it was tense. And it got a lot tenser the next day after Kennedy announced it because the Russians came back and said, you've just put us on the first step to nuclear war uh, because the blockade is illegal. Kennedy's authorizing other aircraft to help the U-2s with the surveillance, so there's Navy Crusaders going over the island. They're flying very low, 500 miles per hour, just skimming over the treetops, taking photos. And some of their photos were really crystal clear. In that big tent in the middle, there's a medium-range ballistic missile. Adlai Stevenson is giving our, our the U.S point of view at the UN. He, um, by the way, he, he should probably get more credit than he, historians gave him because he told Kennedy on day one, hey, maybe we should trade our missiles in Turkey to the Russians, you know, to pull them out. They pull out the ones in Cuba and there won't be any loss of life. And at, at first, Kennedy thought that was a terrible idea, but that's ultimately one of the parts of the arrangement that he came to. But Adlai Stevenson uh, was a proponent of that from day one. But at, at the UN, he did trot out the photos taken by the U-2 pilots to prove that there were missiles there, which was the reason we're doing this, this blockade, which we didn't use the word blockade. We, we tried to use the word quarantine, but it's splitting hairs. It was still stopping the Russians on international water. So now, it's Jerry's turn to fly, and they say, McElmoyle, you do the whole length of Cuba. You're going to photograph four targets. And um, Jerry said, we, I had a clear day. Flight was going good. I'm on my fourth target over the island. When I look in my rearview mirror and I see two contrails coming up towards me. And first I said, rearview mirror in an aircraft like that? He said, oh, yeah, I had some old-fashioned things. And he said, um, one of them exploded, but in the distance, you know, like a good half mile away. He called it a starburst, so the shrapnel would shoot out from this explosion in every direction. And I said, what'd you do next? And he said, I did what I'm trained to do. I took pictures of it. And then he said, when I landed back in Florida safely, of course, the CIA's there and um, uh, the Air Force uh, debriefing people. And I told him what happened. He said that meeting went on for two hours. Then I told all the other pilots. But he said the strange thing was the next day. And this is how I decided to open up the book because it's, you, you want to open up a book with something that pulls the reader in before you give a little of the backstory. So he's landed. He's, he's barely escaped with his life. He's walking out on the tarmac to a U-2 and he hears McElmoyle and he turns around and it's this three-star general. And he goes, yes, sir. And the general goes, I just flew down from Washington. We've analyzed your film and there's nothing on it. And Jerry goes, sir, I know I got the, the starburst on film. And the general goes, there was nothing on it. We've destroyed your film, so we've destroyed your intelligence debriefing because it's faulty. And Jerry goes, sir, I'm positive of what happened and what I got on film. And finally, the general goes, do you understand what I'm telling you? You know, <laughs> zip it up. And um, I give a hypothesis in the book of why this happened and who might have been behind it. But we've never been 100% sure. But it, it's, it's covered up. And then two days later is the day that's known as Black Saturday, and that's when everything goes wrong. 
So if you can imagine, you know, the, the peak of the trajectory of above and beyond, it's, it's all leading up to this day. So I'm going to tell you about two of the events. I'll give you a little bit on the third, but I want there to be uh, some surprises when you read the book, because this is kind of the peak. By the way, Kennedy's only uh, 43 years old. Imagine being that young uh, with the weight of the world on every decision you make. The first event, event or incident, I guess is a better word, occurs with Russian sub B-59. And again, these were things I knew about the Cuban Missile Crisis. I never knew about this. We found this sub approaching the quarantine line. We were dropping practice depth charges to make it come up. We had told the Russians we were going to do that. But apparently the word never got to this commander because he thought they were live depth charges. And after us dropping a whole bunch throughout the course of the day, his nerves are so rattled, he goes, prepare the special torpedo. It's the one torpedo on his sub that has a nuclear warhead. And then he goes, load it in firing tube number three. We're all going to die, but we're going to take them with us. And they've actually got it in the firing tube when another uh, flotilla commander on this sub, who does not have control of this sub, but is of equal rank, uh, steps up and says no. And his name was um, Sergei Arkhipov. Uh, so he gets as much credit as Kennedy is preventing Armageddon. He talks this commander out of firing it. He says, we do not have permission from Moscow to fire this. We don't know for certain if World War III is broken out. So that's based on uh, interviews um, that are public knowledge with the Russians who were in that submarine. So that's a part of the book where you're just like holding your breath because you don't know if he's actually going to fire this. And it would have taken out our aircraft carrier and all the destroyers around it, and it would have been the, the domino effect of all-out nuclear war. I had introduced you to Chuck Maltzby. Now you wonder, wait a minute, he's stationed in Alaska now. Why has he got anything to do with the Cuban Missile Crisis? But he's told, fly over the North Pole and collect radioactive samplings we're monitoring the Russians' programs. And he's got to use celestial navigation because he's going at night. There's no land markers to go by. And they plan for every contingency except the northern lights. <laughs> so now he can't see the stars, so he gets lost. And he said, you know when I really got lost? It was when I was working the radio frequencies and I heard Russian music. <laughs> He's over Russian airspace. The Russians think that this might be the start of a US invasion. So they, send, they don't know what this aircraft is coming towards them. They send up fighter jets to take it down. And this is the part of the story that's it's like out of a James Bond movie. Uh, I don't want to give it all away, but I'll, I'll say one thing. Chuck says to himself, I am not going to be taking POW again because he's now looked at his fuel gauge and sees that it's almost on, on empty. And he does something really bold and daring. He shuts the aircraft down, which means to conserve fuel for whatever landing he could do, not in the USSR. But that means if his pressure suit doesn't work, his blood's going to boil within a minute. He'll be, he'll be dead. And sometimes the pressure suits work, sometimes they didn't. Uh, so he's taking a big gamble. So all these things are happening at once. The MiGs are coming. He's looking at his fuel gauge going down to empty. He's turning off every bit of power on the aircraft. And uh, word's getting back to Washington about what's happening over the skies of Russia. And then, oh, so I'll just point out where he was. He launched from uh, Ison Air Force Base. This was his last radio communication supposed to go over the North Pole and come back the same way, but he drifts to the west and he ends up going right over Russian airspace. And as a coincidence, at the same moment, Major Rudy Anderson is, is launching again. It's his, this is his fourth flight over Cuba now. And um, 
they want him to go over a sensitive area near uh, Guantanamo Bay. And um, Rudy's going over, and the Russians had, you know, they knew about the U-2 overflights. They had the, the technology to track them on radar. And two of the Russian generals are together, and the first one goes early on. He's overstaying his welcome. And then the second one goes, let's get permission to take him down. And they can't get permission because the Supreme Commander is ill. And they decide we have the latitude at our level to do this. So they tell the uh, service to air missile site at Banyes, Cuba, destroy target number 33. And Rudy's over there. He's covering the whole island. He's in a, his aircraft was a CIA model, but it had been painted with the US Air Force. Kennedy didn't want the CIA uh, directly involved in this, probably because he felt he got burned with the Bay of Pigs. But Rudy's going over the island. For him, so far, it's a routine mission. And now here's where I need to speculate a little bit, but you'll see where it's based on fact. When he gets over Banyes, the Russians launch. Banyes would be down near Guantanamo Bay. That's when the Russians launch the missiles. And what I think happened was it wasn't a direct hit, but it was close enough that the shrapnel hit the aircraft. You know, just a piece or two is all it took. And down comes the aircraft. And you'll wonder, here it is on the ground. Rudy was dead inside. No chance to eject. And I'm going to close with the story of why this piece wasn't in, in a thousand little pieces. Because remember, it's coming from 13 miles up. Jerry McElmoyle, who worked closely with me on the book, said, Mike, we got Rudy's body back, and we saw these pictures of the aircraft. What happens is, if it's just wounded, if a U-2 is wounded, it comes down like a leaf from a tree. It'll spin down, it'll lose one wing, then the other, then the tail. And he said that's why it was intact. And when we got the body back, he was still in the pressure suit, and one tiny piece of shrapnel had pierced it. And that's why he never ejected like like Gary Powers did. So I'll leave you on the edge of your seat there. And why don't we do two quick questions, and then I'll take more downstairs. How are we doing for time? We've got five minutes. OK. We got, so we'll do two questions. Does anybody have a question or, or a comment? Because I could close with a, a, a nice story about this incident. Yes. OK. So I dedicated the book to Jerry McElmoyle. Jerry's, I just turned 90, and uh, sharp as attack, became a brigadier general, was later able to prove that they did fire at him. But uh, he was telling me, so the crisis is over, Mike, and President Kennedy, very, you know, in a classy way, decides to come down and thank us. So he goes, I was so excited to meet the President of the United States. And he said, right before he comes, they tell me, Jerry, since you're the lowest ranking guy, you have to stay in the hangar with the aircraft in case somebody from the president's entourage wants to see it. So Jerry says, I'm in the, you know, in the hangar with the aircraft. In comes Kennedy's limousine. And out pops Kennedy with the whole entourage. And Jerry's listening from above. And he hears the president go, I want you all to stay here. I want to have a private conversation with that young man up by the cockpit. So Jerry said, I spent a half hour just me and the president talking about what my missions were like. He said he was the most charming, down-to-earth guy. He said he was sincerely interested in how dangerous it was. And he said, I think it was because he'd been in combat as well uh, during World War II. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.